Good afternoon and good morning to everyone out there. Um, my name is Helen Beale and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webcast. Um, with Range 4, today we're going to be talking about the Atlassian stack. Uh, we are Atlassian experts here at Range 4 and many of you will know us as DevOps Transformation Specialists and Atlassian is one of the key vendor tool sets that we encourage people to use to support their DevOps implementations. Um, but today I want to look at a new offering from Atlassian, um, which they're terming the Atlassian stack. So it's a bit of a dual meaning title to today's webcast because we're going to be looking at the stack um, from the perspective of what products Atlassian offers and how they stack up together to provide um, support for the DevOps loop. But we're also going to be specifically looking at the Atlassian stack, which is a term being used to describe a new license bundle offering. That's what we're going to focus in on uh, today. So let's start with what the Atlassian stack is. Um, it is a bundled offering. It combines every Atlassian server or data center product along with premier support with one single easy to manage price. So that is the Atlassian definition. So it's important to notice that it combines every product. So I'm sure uh, people on the call are probably gonna be Jira users, Confluence users, maybe even Bamboo users, um, but there may be some products you haven't come across before. And we're going to be talking about those as well. So let me move on to the next slide. So here is the pricing um, for the Atlassian stack. And here we have the different grades. So you can see there are different user levels and it starts at 1,000 users um, moving up um, through. And you can see there's two columns here. So we're talking about commercial pricing and also about academic pricing. Um, if you go beyond 10,000 users, um, that's a conversation we need to have with Atlassian, but you can see the different grades here um, and the different price models, all in dollars. So I'm going to talk about everything in dollars today. If you would personally like to transact with us in a different currency, a particular GPP or a British pound, we can also discuss that with you. So one of you or some of you may be asking yourselves, what is an Atlassian data center product? Um, so many of you will be using Atlassian um, pieces of Atlassian software already. You may be using it on the cloud. Um, so many of you will be using Confluence, for example, on the cloud. Some of you may be using server-based products where you've installed it on-premise um, in your own environments. But Atlassian have been doing more and more work on their data center product lines as well. So you can see here that we have four of the products currently available um, in the data center versions. So that's Jira Software, uh, Confluence, Bitbucket, and Jira Service Desk. So the data center deployment options are on-premise options. So they're like the server options, but they're designed um, to give you HA, so high availability, greater performance, and better uh, scalability in your own data centers. Um, of course, your data center could be in the cloud. So you could be deploying these um, directly into AWS or Azure um, or into your own um, machine rooms. So let's have a, a closer look at the high availability piece. So the high availability piece, the three things that I said were around uh, HA performance and um, the, the ability to manage load. So first of all, we've got the capability to do active active clustering. Um, so it should a piece of hardware fail, um, either in your data center or in cloud, that you put it in, you don't need to worry about that. The data center products also use um, load balancing, um, anything you're using um, or some stuff they have themselves to distribute the load across your clusters. And we minimize the single points of failure um, by using some industry standard technologies for the database clustering um, and sharing the file systems. From the performance perspective, um, you can see here that we are able to um, increase the capacity for concurrent users across each node in the cluster. Um, we can increase the application throughput to avoid any performance in the event of you having a load spike. So um, whether that's a particular type of day or time of year, um, we can manage that so your users don't experience any um, poor performance from you. And then we can dedicate some nodes um, to ensure that you have the highest possible quality of service. So um, on the scalability, so the third element here, uh, what we have uh, is the ability to um, make new no nodes join the cluster um, without having any downtime. So there's an automatic synchronization uh, indexing that can happen, and there is rapid re-indexing that can be managed as well. Um, and because all of these Atlassian products are, um, are licensed by user rather than by server or by VMs or CPUs or PVUs if you're in the IBM world, um, it's much easier for you to manage without suddenly getting masses of additional license costs. Of course, we can't 
um, tell what your own infrastructure costs will be, but we can manage it from a, a user license perspective. So in the Atlassian stack offering, as we said, there is all of the Atlassian products. And I'm going to talk about um, some of the newer products in the portfolio in a little while. Um, and we're going to go into each of these in a, a bit more detail because some of them you might not be so familiar with. So um, as we just said, the four products that are currently available in the data center to have these HA high performance um, scalability versions are Jira Software, Bitbucket, Jira Service Desk and Confluence. Um, then the other server products that are included in the stack are Jira Core, HipChat, Bamboo, Crowd, Fisheye, and Crucible, and Clover as well, though we're not going to go into much detail on Clover today. Um, there are a number of add-ons, so four add-ons that are also included in the stack, uh, Portfolio for Jira, Capture for Jira, Questions, and Team Calendars for Confluence. We're going to look at those in a bit more detail in a moment as well. And importantly, um, also included in the stack is Premier Support, which has a price tag of $35,000 per year starting. So we showed you the, um, the table already um, around the, the user pricing here. Um, so the academic annual price, we're, for example, we're looking at is, is 111 here and it's 1882.50. So if you worked in academia, um, if we looked at the standard price list, um, for all of these products, and I've done them for 2,000 users here, so this is a quote take, taken straight out of Mac, which is the My Atlassian, um, which is the, the way that we provide our customers with quotes. And I've done them for 2,000 users specifically because some of the products um, only have sort of a 500 to 2,000 tier. Um, and when we're doing some of the add-ons, so if we're doing things like the portfolio for Jira, um, it actually wants us to add it onto an existing line. So there are, um, in the notes on the slide, there are a few things to um, just be aware of. But just an as an example here, what I've shown is if that we were to take a 2,000 users for all of the products that we've listed on the previous page, um, that total uh, retail or list price is $426,500. Whereas on the academic price list, it's 111. That's a little bit more um, for commercial at 188. But you'll see um, some very significant savings here. So there's a $314,000 saving, which is uh, a 74% discount. So absolutely massive discounts. Um, and another thing I haven't included, included on the quote here, because the quote mechanism doesn't allow me to, um, is the premier support like pricing. So there's actually another $35,000 of savings here. So there's a huge savings. So we meet very few customers today that are using all of these products. So it made me wonder what the pricing would look like if we picked some of the products um, that people generally use. So on this slide, what I'm showing um, is the kind of most popular products that we see. Um, so Again, if we're taking just these four products, um, so the 2,000 users, and I've picked the data center versions for all of the um, products that are available in the data center. We have a 48,000 price tag on each of these four, Jira Software, HipChat, Confluence, and Bitbucket. Um, so you're already making a saving um, in academia, although it's coming out about the same um, in commercial, if you are going with the stack. So it's a very efficient way of purchasing Atlassian software. Now, um, Atlassian have done lots of things very cleverly in their lifetime. Um, they've come up with a, a land and expand model. So it kind of sits between two of the, the models that we see. So the, the classic licensing model that came from all the big vendors that we all worked with for many, many years was an enterprise licensing model where you'd go with a vendor and it was probably quite a big price tag and you'd spend some time negotiating with them, probably getting a special bid, um, and then you would buy your software. Um, then about sort of 10 years ago, I guess the open source software started to come through um, and lots of people started to use that model where you could download and start using the software for free, which has been really valuable to lots of organizations over the past few years, particularly as we've worked our way through a recession and people have had very restricted budgets. And it's really also um, suited the way that DevOps has evolved because DevOps is very much a grassroots movement. So we've had lots of people wanting to do things, wanting to experiment, trying to do things under the radar with very restricted budgets. So having access to free software that they can download from the internet has helped lots and lots of people um, move on uh, with their projects. Now, of course, um, we do live in a world that has uh, an ec economy, and we have a global economy, um, and most businesses uh, need money in order to pay their employees and to invest in research and development. 
Silicon Valley kind of has got around that to some extent in recent years um, because they've gone for a VC type model. So you have an idea for some great software, you pitch it to some people with some money, they give you some money, you go away and build it, you build a company, you may take, take further series of funding, um, always heading for an IPO. And then we've got these wonderful unicorns that IPO at a billion dollars plus. Um, Alas, it is on something slightly different. So they did take some funding, but they have a land and expand model. So there are some pieces of software that are free, um, but most require you to, to spend a small amount. And lots of organizations or people, individuals within organizations will start buying Atlassian software um, for a small amount on their credit card, uh, maybe on a company credit card. But what tends to happen over time is that um, they use more and more of the software. The system automates um, the uplift to the cost as more and more users are added and they go through the user tiers. Um, and people buy different flavors of the software at different times of the year. And it starts to become quite unwieldy. So um, something like Stack can help us reconcile all of that and make it much more simple and cost effective to buy this software, much more easy to manage. Um, and it's probably worth just noting on all of those open source organizations that give away their software so the puppets and the chefs and the jenkins of this world all these worlds all of their um, investment funding business cases are all predicated on the fact that they have an enterprise version so they will be charging for um, usually a version that includes support um, also a version that includes uh, maybe some add-ons different plugins so if you look for example at the cloud version of jenkins um, you get support and all sorts of um, extras to help you manage those environments um, you do get support with all of the Atlassian products, but with Stack, you get premier support as well. So um, some uh, heightened SLAs. So let's have a look at the products that are in the Stack in a little bit more detail. So we're going to start with Jira software, um, probably something that many of you on the call are already using. So as it says, the number one software development tool used by Agile teams. So um, support Scrum and Agile uh, really effectively. You can create your user stories in it and manage your product backlog. Um, you can uh, groom, if you want to use that word, or refine your product backlog um, effectively in Jira. Um, and you can use workflows. So you can either you choose one of the out-of-box workflows or you can uh, make or customize your own workflow. Um, we're going to come to this at, at the end of the presentation, actually, and revisit this. But um, one of the areas that Atlassian isn't particularly strong in is in testing software or testing automation software. So that does do lots and lots of integration. So um, in particular, in particular, to things like Zephyr. Um, and it's also very good at integrating across its own tool set. And we'll come back to that as well when we look at the DevOps loop at the end. So that's Jira software. Um, we also have Bitbucket. So um, if you need some kind of uh, repository, code repository, you may just use Git or you may choose to use Bitbucket, um, which they describe as code collaboration on steroids. And it's a very, very scalable version of Git. Um, there is a data center version, so you can ensure that you've got performance. You can have lots and lots and lots of your um, developers branching every day um, with very few problems. So very another very popular product, um, also cloud versions available. Um, a newer product from, uh, from Atlassian that is included in the stack is the Jira Service Desk. So a direct competitor to things like ServiceNow. Um, the Service Desk is really for the, the IT ops people. So Atlassian's positioning of themselves in the marketplace is really around teams. So um, they are very much focused on DevOps. They regularly speak at our DevOps um, conferences and our events that we run about how they've done DevOps themselves. Uh, the service desk is basically a ticketing desk. So it allows you to um, allows people to self-serve. So it allows them to register their own tickets and it allows you to route them through um, the automation and, and be prioritized in, in the way according to the SLAs that you've defined um, with your customer internal or external. And again, the integration piece is really, really key. So you can link Jira service desk tickets to Jira software issues. So you've got that transparency um, through from ops to dev um, and being able to keep um, track of what's going on and being able to report back on progress to people that need to know. Confluence is another one of the really big uh, names from, from Atlassian's, kind of where it all started. So um, this is the platform that allows us to collaborate. So it allows us to do 
um, not project management per se. We'll come back to some add-ons in a moment that enable that, that kind of project portfolio management, but it enables people to collaborate on a project. project. So one of the big challenges we have with some of the larger enterprises that we work with is around geographic dispersion. So we have teams and they may be a single scrum team that are actually in different areas or there will be multiple scrum teams in different geographic, um, potentially kind of in different continent locations. Um, but the scrum teams are essentially um, committing to the same code base or at least the same application so that may, um, may have architected the application quite loosely so that they can update their own um, piece without any dependencies on other pieces. But there is certainly a need to be communicating with the rest of the team about what else is happening in that particular application. So Confluence is really effective at helping people um, that are spread out remotely to centralise um, data and information and thoughts about what's happening in the software that a lot of people are working on. So we've got this concept of the single source of the truth, so having this transparency and the central place. And it's probably worth asking um, yourselves how you do this if you don't have something like Confluence. And um, traditionally, I guess we would have used things like email, very difficult to track, potentially Word documents, either emailed around or potentially held in a file system. Again, quite difficult to, to version control and keep track of, um, quite difficult to get multiple users working on the, at the same time. Um, other people might use spreadsheets, other people might use SharePoint, um, and there are plenty of articles out there comparing Confluence and SharePoint. I can spend more time with you outside of this session talking about that if you would like to. Um, then we've got the Jira Core piece, and we're going to revisit Jira Core um, again at the end when we talk about some of Atlassian's very recent trans uh, acquisitions. So Jira Core is very much about business project management software. So where Jira Software is very focused on supporting Agile teams and the way that they work. Jira Core is much more around project management. So not portfolio management, we'll come back to that, but project management itself. So again, we have the ability to, to look at workflows so we can track tasks through it, so we can set um, project goals, or project tasks, and allow us to see how we're doing against them. A bit like in Jira Software, we'd be looking, for example, for burn down charts in our sprint backlogs. Um, because we've got the, the task management, we've got statuses and comments and attachments all in one place. So it's very easy for anybody to look at a project suite us very quickly without having to email people to ask questions or set up meetings. And I've already had at least one conversation with one customer today um, about trying to set up um, a, a rare meeting with us, actually, in a few weeks' time. But it, even in three weeks' time, being unable to find a meeting room available on their site because everybody seems to be in meetings all the time. So this is kind of one of the bad cultural um, attributes that we're trying to get away from with DevOps is meeting for meeting's sake. And tools like this can make that much easier. Um, very much like Jira software, this enables us to really quickly see um, using things like dashboards or predefined reports um, where we are with a particular project. So HipChat, so don't know what you're using for chat today. We use a bit of HipChat. Um, we're quite a small company with lots of different partners that we need to work with, so we end up using lots of different things. HipChat is a very effective enterprise chat mechanism. We tend to use um, things like Skype and Slack as well, but HipChat is very much designed um, for business. So it's very searchable. We do video calling and screen sharing, um, and it's got lots of security, and that's a really key one, um, particularly for some of the financial customers that we we work with. And it has um, this capability around app mentions. So you'll be very familiar with that with Twitter, but being able to, to flag people so that they get a notification um, that they need to um, get involved with the discussion that's going on. Um, and I put a little star up here for chat, op chat ops, because this is a big thing um, in DevOps now. So um, being able to, to swarm when there is a problem, being able to automate um, or integrate the automations and messages coming out of your systems um, into live chat streams with, with real humans. So again, we have all of these integrations with the uh, Atlassian products that you would expect, so Jira, Bitbucket, um, but also with these third-party applications that are very popular, uh, like Google Hangouts and Zendesk and, and lots, lots more. Um, and it's quite fun too. So um, I particularly enjoy when I'm Skype using things like the um, the movie con or the movie uh, emojis um, and there's more things like that as well so um, can inject a little bit of fun into what we do on a day-to-day -day basis so um, 
bamboo. So we have some very significant customers who are becoming more and more um, reliant on bamboo. It's quite an interesting journey that quite a few of them have been on. So um, lots of people we know that are using bamboo now started out with Jenkins um, and Team City often as well. And particularly, we find a lot of people that particularly love Team City, love using it, find it um, very useful. But when we start using bamboo and realise um, how easy it is to connect with, particularly if you're using Bitbucket and Jira software as well. So being able to track these features as they go through the development pipeline um, becomes really, really key. So bamboo um, in the Elastin world is what underpins continuous delivery, which um, if we're going to talk about DevOps and talk about people, process, tools, uh, tools and automation, then a lot of people think that what underpins DevOps is continuous delivery. Um, argue, we are argue that point quite a lot because it is kind of key but we meet so many organizations that have put cd pipelines in but are struggling to get them utilized throughout the organization because they haven't addressed the cultural issues so we spend a lot of time with lots of organizations looking at the culture looking at how we need need to get exec support to move from um, fear driven or blame oriented cultures um, how we can uh, provide more autonomy to the people that are kind of doing the work how we can connect strategy to activity um, all of those kind of things and hip chat will help us underpin all of that sorry bamboo helps us underpin all of that um, with allowing us to create the cd pipeline to push all of this stuff through so crowd this is um, a, a much less well-known product from atlassian but very important from an id management perspective so it enables us to give uh, use a single sign-on, um, whether they're coming from AD or LDAP, um, gives us a single admin console. Um, there's some very big customers that are using it, as you can see here. So we've got people like BMW and Twitter and, and Citrix um, that are big users of this tool. Um, you can see here a, a little diagram how we connect all of the Atlassian toolings, tools via crowd into the directories. Here, yeah, just making our lives much more simple. And I'm sure um, we've all been in a situation, I know I spend some of my time setting up aliases in our email cloud system um, for putting last names in for people that don't have first names, putting shortenings in. Um, lots of people spell my first name, sorry, my second name wrong by putting an extra E on the end. So putting lots of aliases in to try and um, help the email systems go right. And of course, if we've got multiple systems, we've got multiple usernames and life becomes quite complicated. So Fisheye, this is another not so well known um, tool. So with Fisheye, you can see uh, it's basically enabling us to understand the code changes that are going on um, within the systems better. So if we're looking at things like Jira software, we can view the changes that are happening side by side and compare the differences. Um, we can look at things graphically and look at code over time and get a visual audit trail of changes. So instead of kind of reaming through screens and screens of code, we can get some, um, some quite quick visualization. Um, you'll see Crucible mentioned here as well. We're going to go on to that next. So um, the other important thing is that Fisheye does um, work with any SCM. So uh, as well as Bitbucket, it also does Subversion, Git, Mercurial, CVS, Perforce, um, pretty much whatever you've got. So if you've got multiple SCMs, with lots of organizations that we work with do have multiple SCMs, is kind of getting into a bit of the debate about tools, tools standardization in DevOps um, and whether um, we can tell all teams to use the same thing, which is one of the most um, controversial uh, discussions we often have with organizations. Us as technologists, we're quite passionate about the tools we know and love um, and don't like being told what tool to use. So it's important to have other tools integrate um, across a lot of tools. So instead, we're moving on to Crucible. So Crucible enables us to do peer code review. Um, so uh, it can be quite formal or it can be quite quick. Um, you can assign reviewers from wherever in your team and you can turn uh, a review into a discussion and comment. So it, it really enables you to, to have a look at your commits and, and things and see what's going on. Um, you can start looking at code quality, so this can help with shifting left and and, def and reducing the number of defects. So we can start analysing which parts of code base may not have been sufficiently peer reviewed yet, um, or have sufficient tests put, put on them. 
And another key thing about this this part or crucible in particular is it really helps us with audit and compliance. So it gives us a complete audit trail um, with lots of code review details. So um, getting on to the four add-ons that you remember that we have um, in the stack, this is the first add-on. Um, so this is Portfolio for Jira. So this is like a higher level of project management. So it's actually managing your portfolio of projects. So um, starting to see all of the Jira projects that you have in one roadmap um, and being able to then start forecasting release dates um, based on the estimates that you've got in Jira. This really helps with resource management um, and it really helps us to understand the velocity and helps us optimise the velocity in a team. Um, and we'll come on to something else um, in, in calendars in a second that, that helps even more with the, the resource management perspective. Um, there's also the ability to, to kind of commit or revert. So it's kind of a higher level, it's less auto automated in that um, we're not automating going through gates and testing and doing uh, CD or C deployment, um, but it does enable us at a project level to decide whether we are happy and whether we want to proceed. Importantly, and this is um, again getting back to Atlassian being around the team. Um, yes, this is software. Yes, it does automation, but a lot of it is more about collaboration. Um, what we really need to do in DevOps is understand the value stream and ensure that we understand the organizational why from a cultural perspective and a business goal perspective and match these two things. So Portfolio for Jira allows us to inject um, intelligence around what the actual business goals are so that we can ensure that what's being set from um, in a traditional hierarchy quite high up um, is filtering down. If we are in a more uh, distributed authority environment, we can then look at the, the goals um, that are being set by the autonomous teams. And once more, we've got the, uh, the visualization or the graphical capability to look at that in more detail. So another one um, of the add-ons for JIRA is this capture. Um, capability. So um, being able to, to do screenshots um, and annotate and share them, but co collect them in JIRA. So um, having this facility within JIRA just makes it a lot easier than kind of doing uh, screenshots outside and then going and downloading files or up at attaching files and then trying to get into them to annotate them. This is all done um, within JIRA. So it's it's very, um, it, it really just gives us a next, another extra boost in terms of uh, velocity through the process of um, reviewing and, and deploying. So the third add-on that we have is questions for Confluence. So this is the internal Q&A system. So this allows us to ask questions and um, effectively crowdsource answers. So it's basically like a knowledge base. So a um, few people or a few vendors have had a go at, at knowledge-driven tools over the years. So we've seen autonomy. Uh, there's some tools coming out from from Lotus and, and IBM a while back to create knowledge bases. But this is the idea of, of getting everybody to, to get the things that they know out of their heads, um, stopping people asking the same questions over and over again and enabling them to find the answers, enabling them to quickly find the experts or the subject matter experts in an organization um, very quickly. Um, it could be through a blog that somebody's written or a question that somebody's answered. Um, or it could be a, a page that's in Confluence um, itself. That somebody's written um, and you can organize all of this so you can create topics and you can start following topics to that are of particular interest for you um, and uh, follow particular experts so the final add-on and um, this is the other one that I was talking about in terms of being really key to maximizing the team um, resource management capability so this is team calendars for confluence so um, typically most of us are using either iCal or Outlook calendars um, we've probably opened it up to a few of our colleagues, so we've started to share our calendars. Um, you can kind of open a few calendars on in your calendar tool at, at any one time and see, look for free time and that kind of thing. Um, but this um, is the your team's single source of truth again, so um, to reuse that phrase that we were talking about earlier with Confluence. But uh, you can do things like manage the team leave, uh, track the projects and people's um, inputs into those projects and the planning events. Um, so it connects with JIRA. Again, very important how much and closely it connects uh, with JIRA. So those are the key components um, in the Atlassian stack. Um, Atlassian status page, which was an acquisition 
Um, a few months ago now is also available in the stack. Um, it's not currently available to price in the same way that the others are um, in Mac, which is why I didn't include it in my quote in the first few slides. But um, a very useful way of helping your customers understand if you've got a problem with your website without necessarily overloading your support desk. So um, status page helps you pop up a page if you're experiencing a performance outage or performance issue. So if people come to your website um, and they're trying to do something, they don't necessarily immediately try and call a support desk. Um, they, uh, you, can, you can let them know that something is happening, you're aware of it, and you are working on it. And just wanted to, to finish uh, with the final, uh, with the recent acquisition, sorry, last week. So last week it was announced um, that Atlassian bought Trello. Um, if you download the slides and anyone on this call, you're going to get a link to the slides on SlideShare after this. This particular slide has got a link in the notes to a blog I wrote uh, earlier on in the week or last week, can't remember, um, about this acquisition. Quite a big one. So uh, nearly half a billion um, price tag. Quite a lot of that in cash as well. And there's a nice quote from Jay Simons, who's the CEO of Atlassian here, um, that just very close to Trello. So um, I think lots of people in the past have thought it's a bit of an either or between Jira and Trello, which do you use, um, which is better, which looks nicer. Um, Trello has quite a well-established base of um, non-IT users. I think Jira is typically, um, even though as we described earlier, um, that it's a bis about business pro project management, Typically, Jira has been used more by IT departments. Um, I think there's a, often a question mark when there's an acquisition like this where there is seemingly an existing tool in the acquisitive company's portfolio. There's a question about whether they're actually buying um, the software for the software's sake or whether they're buying for the customer base. I think it's a bit of both here. So um, there's a lot of synergy. Uh, if you read the article or the blog, um, and it links through to Jay Simon's own blog, uh, on the acquisition, there's a lot of synergy. Sorry to use that word twice because I, th I think it's very overused, but a lot of similarities between the thinking um, and the approaches and the kind of mentality of both organisations, Trello and Atlassian. So they have this same or shared audacious goal now of having 100 million active users of of the products. So they're looking to to work together to expand that. Uh, the CEO. Um, of Trello is expected to retain that same role within Atlassian. They're expected to uh, run Trello as a separate product for certainly the short to, to medium term. Um, but I imagine it will pop up in stack at some point, which is good news for the many organisations out there that are using uh, both pieces of software. So just to finish, um, just wanted to talk about the DevOps loop for a moment. So um, we often use this um, in our uh, assessments and things that we do with organisations. So this is our SDLC, how we represent the software development lifecycle these days. We used to represent it in a very linear um, kind of waterfall format, but this is really about seeing it as a continuous release cycle. So you can see we've got, uh, we like to call this IVA. So we have ideation all the way through to realization by integration, validation, and operation. Um, and we go around and around this loop. Um, you may be wondering where development is. Well, we refer to that now as integration because Actually, what we see is very few developers coding code these days. What we see is them composing applications um, from artifacts, uh, whether they're open source or things that have been built internally. Uh, we see this much more as a kind of composition integration activity. So you can see um, I've tried to put where the various Atlassian tools sit on the, the loop. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, you can see there's a bit of a gap here around validation. So um, we've, you know, we talked a bit about peer-to-peer -peer review and, and things around Crucible. So, you know, arguably we could put some of them down here. But the the big test automation uh, applications, so things like Cucumber and Zephyr and Silk Test and things like that would would sit down here. There's also a bit of a gap you'll notice up here at Realization. So, um, this is really uh, where we are measuring the real business value of a new feature that has gone live. Um, this is where we've been looking towards things like application performance management tools, uh, digital performance management tools, so things like Dynatrace and AppDynamics and New Relic. Uh, again, on our blog, you can find um, a recent blog uh, referring back to the newest uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant for application release automation that came out in December. Uh, the three vendors that I just mentioned all sitting in the top right-hand quadrant in terms of leaders and visionaries, and Dynatrace is also one of our partners. 
So that is the end of today's webcast. I'm just going to uh, check and see if we've got any questions today. So I can't see any questions on the questions area. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the stack or whether you um, can uh, transfer the existing Atlassian licensing that you have to us uh, and into the stack, then let us know. Um, I do have a question um, from one of the participants, which is, is Bamboo both build and deploy? Um, yes, it is. We have some customers I can get you to speak with that can explain how they're doing that at the moment. Um, it's not, I wouldn't describe Bamboo as an application release automation tool in the same way that we might consider something like um, Zebra Labs or Urban Code or CA Nolio to be at that level at this point. Um, you can also use it in tandem with orchestration tools like Puppet. Um, but we really need to understand uh, more about where you are at currently and what your deployment requirements are. Um, and the next question I've also had um, also relating to Bamboo is, does it integrate with Maven or other dependency management tools? Uh, a yes, absolutely it does. Um, the particular artifact repository that uh, I'm thinking of with one of our customers is Artifactory. I know of others that are also using it with with Nexus and Maven as well. Um, and it's probably worth, if we're on that subject around artifact repositories and talking about uh, binary artifacts. I, a moment ago when we were looking at the DevOps loop, I talked about uh, integration as the point of where we talk about um, composing applications and building applications, often from binary artifacts. And I think it's worth noting at this point that one of the things that it's really important to do um, particularly in the world that we're starting to move into, where a lot of those artifacts are coming from the open source environment. Um, a lot of them have vulnerabilities that we might not be aware of, or they might have uh, license risks. So even though they look like they're open source, if you dig a bit deeper into the license terms, you might find that if you use the software in certain ways in production or such like, you might find that you are actually in con contravention of those commercial, of those license agreements, and you may be um, charged, commercial charge. So... Um, there are tools, um, particularly solid types and access lifecycle, that we can integrate into the integration uh, part of that lifecycle, which will enable people to uh, identify very early what those risks look like. So typically people might do that kind of work by doing stuff like uh, penetration testing or automated app scanning. Um, but we can actually integrate that into the IDE, so into the integrated development environment to pull out and call out those things very early on. So I don't think I have any more questions. So I'm going to say thank you very much for your time today. And uh, uh, thank you for your attendance. Thanks and goodbye.